Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Martin Rees, President of the Royal Society. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's lecture. I first must do the housekeeping and ask everyone to please turn off your mobile phones. I ask this not for the usual reason, but because this lecture is being web-streamed and recorded, and so it's very important that uh, we don't have distracting noises. Before introducing the speaker, perhaps I could just say a word about the Royal Society. Uh, we are the UK's and Commonwealth's main academy for science, and we have been going since 1660. In fact, you may have seen in the newspapers in the last couple of days quite a bit of publicity about the society, and that's because yesterday we had our anniversary meeting in AGM, and it was the first day of our 350th anniversary year, during which we're having quite a number of special activities. We put on our website yesterday a rather interesting timeline uh, of our history, including the uh, texts of 60 papers that we'd published in our journals from the time of Newton, his experiments with prisms and uh, the rainbow, uh, right up to modern times with a fascinating commentary. So I recommend, if I can give you a little commercial, uh, that you look at the uh, trailblazing website at the Royal Society and you'll find other things on the Royal Society's website. I should just say that uh, in the uh, anniversary year, we are uh, continuing our regular range of activities, uh, policy studies and scientific meetings, etc. We have some extra activities. We are celebrating uh, scientists around the country in what we call the Local Heroes Programme. We have uh, liaisons with many of the museums and galleries in London and also with the BBC to try and not only promote the society but raise the profile of science because although we look back with pride over our history, we are forward-looking and we want to uh, look forward and emphasise that uh, many of the world's problems can only be solved with the proper application of science to them and the involvement of a wide public in both the cultural aspect of science and also the choices we have to make in how we apply science. Well, the lecture this evening has a title which uh, is very fitting because the title goes from the past to the future and uh, that's very fitting uh, for a special lecture at the Royal Society. And our speaker uh, is Professor Steve Hopper and he's the 14th director of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. He's by profession a plant conservation biologist, well known for pioneering research leading to positive conservation outcomes in southwest Australia, which is one of the few temperate zone global biodiversity hotspots. He's also known for the collaborative description of 300 new plant taxa. He holds visiting professorships at Reading University and in Western Australia and in Perth. So no one could be better to address us on the topic of biodiversity and botany, and so it's my great pleasure and privilege to invite Professor Stephen Hopper to give his lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Rees. Um, my lords and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour and privilege to be able to uh, be here tonight and, and uh, offer this address. Um, this is the last official uh, function of Q's 250th anniversary year and uh, what a pleasure it is to be here at the Royal Society at the start of their 350th anniversary celebration. Um, for those of you who are angry philatelists, uh, I wanted to assure you that on originally proposing the title of the talk, um, the word not was put in the title, and uh, I hope by the end of the lecture I will have convinced you that and is the more appropriate connector of the two ideas. So if you feel uh, as though you've come under false pretenses, I won't mind in the least if you, if you want to leave at this stage. <laughs> <coughs> what I would like to do is, is put forward a few introductory propositions about uh, botanical science. Um, and then take a, a, a very quick canter through some uh, 
chronology of uh, botanical science and some of the, the big ideas uh, that really have moved uh, botany in, into uh, the formal science that it is today. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll handle that fairly quickly so that I can focus on present circumstances and uh, what we might do for the future, which I think is, uh, is, is most apt uh, in terms of the challenges we all face. Um, so a couple of opening quotes that uh, I would like to put, for you, uh, put to you. This is uh, from Professor, Professor Ayer's uh, wonderful account of uh, the contribution of three generations of Darwins um, towards botanical science and, and the proposition that uh, plants are just fundamental to the history of our species and indeed will determine the future. And I rather like Charles Darwin's quote uh, that, is, that appeared in uh, his uh, 1876 publication in his autobiography uh, about the pleasure that he got from exalting plants in the scale of organised beings. So I would hope to uh, offer a case for ongoing exaltation. I want to focus on Q and uh, the disciplines that are particularly strong both in the history of Q and, and going into the future. Um, so there, there are three uh, aspects of the discipline, discipline of, uh, of science at Kew, what I call the big science areas, um, systematics, phytogeography and economic botany. Big science in the sense that they were foundational at Kew and they continue to be fundamental uh, to the contribution that Kew and its partners around the world make. Um, <clears throat> secondly, uh, obviously after 1859... Uh, evolutionary botany became uh, progressively more and more important to what Q does and uh, uh, seed physiology and reproductive biology was introduced uh, particularly following the establishment of the Jodrell Laboratory in the, the 1870s. And since the 1960s uh, there has been a, a tangible shift uh, uh, led by Professor Heslop Harrison when he was director you know, towards conservation biology um, applying uh, molecular techniques to systematics, uh, DNA sequencing and the like, and most recently um, looking at uh, how we might apply um, new disciplines such as restoration ecology to improve human welfare. Now, the opening proposition is this uh, choice of the three-letter word, and uh, um, I, I think uh, if you read the history of botanical science and there is ongoing debate as, in, as there is in broad science about uh, the difference between facts uh, versus causes, pattern and process, description and experiment. And uh, amateur botany and, and what was called philosophical botany before uh, the word science really took on. Um, and uh, the, the proposition that I would put to you is that uh, both sides of these and statements are critical, in fact, for the, for the advancement of knowledge. Um, that, that without uh, accumulating facts, uh, strategically albeit, uh, we will never understand causes and vice versa. Uh, without understanding pattern, uh, we can't get at process. Uh, without adequate description and targeted description, then we can't devise appropriate experiments. And uh, there is an ongoing interaction between those people who... Um, uh, um, take on a study of science for the, fear, uh, the, the sheer joy and pleasure of, of discovery um, versus those who were philosophical and uh, rather financially well endowed at the start but now are uh, paid professionals in the, in the disciplines. And I want to just start uh, at 1759. Um, uh, Neil McGregor, the director of the British Museum, has made the point uh, eloquently on several occasions, that London was one of the few European cities that didn't have a university uh, in 1759 and that a case could be made that, in fact, the British Museum and Kew were the open universities, the places where the public could come to understand the broader world, the universe, um, uh, and enjoy an, an experience that is equivalent to what universities now now offer. And I think that's one of the unique aspects of London that is very exciting and, and indeed continues uh, through to the present day. Economic botany is one of the foundational disciplines of Q, of course, goes back quite a long way, and I would argue it goes right back to human evolution. Our Australopithecine ancestors, in fact, uh, were involved uh, intimately in economic botany in the sense of obtaining livelihoods from wild nature. 
and uh, with some of the very exciting uh, recent work uh, looking at tooth enamels uh, and isotope variation. Um, in this uh, artist representation of a, of a hominid family, the male is handing, uh, hanging onto a bone to deal with the aggressors, but uh, the, f the lady really should have a digging stick uh, because it's, it's very clear that our lineage, in fact, relied uh, perhaps far more Im importantly on female uh, gathering than on male um, aggression. Uh, and uh, uh, the acquisition of uh, tubers in particular for, for human food goes back a long way. The plants are important for a, a number of other reasons and I've, I've uh, chosen Sir Walter Raleigh and tobacco plantation here just to bring in the agricultural theme. Uh, agriculture is, is a fundamental underpinning of contemporary society. Uh, the choice of crops uh, and how to grow them uh, is a, a really important part of uh, ongoing human livelihoods. Some of the crops chosen end, end up to be not as beneficial as first thought and tobacco would be a case in point. But um, we use plants in a way that influences human livelihoods and uh, has direct financial and economic implications across the range of areas of human activity highlighted in this slide. From a systematic point of view, uh, we look to Carl Linnaeus uh, and uh, Species Plantarum, published in 1753, which was the foundational book uh, that established contemporary binomial nomenclature. Linnaeus didn't invent this, but he was uh, such a, a passionate advocate for it um, as a way of uh, making it easier for his students to remember the names of organisms with just two names instead of the very long polynomials that... Uh, were in vogue before his time. And uh, that tradition continues right to, through to the present day as an effective means of communication, the genus and the species. Linnaeus also set out to uh, uh, compile an inventory of all the known uh, plants, animals and minerals on, on the planet uh, and uh, uh, estimated in his day that about five to 6,000 species of plants were on the planet. He also came up with what is known as the sexual system as an easy way of identifying and classifying plants based on the number of male and female parts in the flower, uh, a very practical approach to uh, applying classification, but demonstrably not, uh, not natural, as, as uh, the French would call it. Uh, the French had a, a fine tradition, in fact, of arguing that we should be looking at all the features of organisms uh, to try and understand relationships, not just the the floral parts in the case of plants. And, uh, and their view, in fact, uh, is the one that prevails today, not Linnaeus' sexual system that lasted uh, for about uh, 50 years, a bit, bit longer in some quarters. Um, but a natural system is what all uh, systematic botanists aspire to right through to the present. Some rather interesting ideas were around in 1759 too about uh, global terrestrial uh, biogeographical bio regions. Um, uh, people like Linnaeus and Tournefort took a literal tra translation from the Bible and argued that uh, plants and animals all started on Mount Ararat and spread out uh, from, that, from that place. And likewise, the elevational zones on Mount Ararat were the precursors for the origin of global biomes. <coughs> um, Buffon made a significant contribution. I've just jumped a little, a little ahead of 1759. Um, but he argued that the polar regions must have been the first places in which life on Earth evolved. Uh, and that's a, a really interesting idea. It was based on the physical properties of the globe uh, and uh, arguing that the, the terminal points were probably most likely the, the places uh, where life must have evolved. At that stage, uh, the age of the Earth, of course, was not uh, anywhere near known accurately. And Buffon was also the first to point out that um, in equivalent climatic zones fundamentally different organisms could be found. He focused on mammals in this 1761 uh, 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 paper, but uh, uh, people very rapidly began to observe that uh, in the same climatic zone, in the same habitat uh, across the globe, you could have different organisms. And this was a significant conundrum um, in terms of interpreting. So let me take you through the, the first 100 years, and I, I call this the, the age of global exploration and philosophical botany, uh, and the global exploration is, is best illustrated by uh, both uh, Linnaeus and Sir Joseph Banks. Uh, this is a map showing where Linnaeus's 
students travelled to help uh, uh, the August professor compile his global inventory, and uh, they all um, were PhD students as well. Joseph Banks followed the same model, and indeed he was uh, actively involved, as, as you'd be aware, on the Cook expedition with Daniel Solander, um, Linnaeus's favourite pupil, uh, who came to London and worked with Banks uh, after the Cook expedition. So Joseph Banks, uh, this formidable portrait is here uh, in the Royal Society. Um, uh, Martin just told me that um, in Banks's day, uh, he bankrolled the Royal Society and he also was president for 42 years. And uh, uh, I'm assured that these days neither the financial obligation nor the stamina <laughs> is evident in, uh, in contemporary presidents. <coughs> Um, Bank is, Banks is, is famous for his, uh, his participation, self-funded in the Cook Expedition that, uh, among other things, uh, discovered the east coast of Australia, and for being a patron of science. Um, he was passionate about plants and plant collecting uh, and arguably made his uh, reputation as a collector uh, more than um, what you might call a being a philosophical botanist. He also befriended King George III and... Uh, um, out of that friendship came de facto directorship of Q. Again, he was self-funded, so he didn't need a salary, but his object uh, expressed to the king was to make Q this great botanical exchange house for the empire. Q came in, into existence as uh, an arm of empire to uh, uh, collect, catalogue, document uh, botanically the world's flora and uh, focus on those plants that uh, established new forms of agriculture that were of economic benefit. Uh, Charles Darwin's grandfather Erasmus is uh, argued, uh, argu arguably um, one of the first philosophical botanists in the sense of uh, the, that terminology as used in the late 1700s and into the 1800s. And in 1800 he published his most famous work, uh, Phytologia. Um, he was very eloquent, he used poetry uh, to convey um, uh, scientific ideas. He was focused on process, on uh, dynamism, uh, and he was one of the first people to really celebrate how, how plants function and to advocate the Enlightenment view that you should be measuring and experimenting to better understand plant life. So he, he, plays, a, a special, he plays a, a, a special place uh, in the history of botany from that point of view. Alexander von Humboldt is the most celebrated traveller and polymath, uh, his famous trip um, uh, to uh, South America. And uh, plant vegetation types being correlated with climate uh, was, is one of his more famous observations in relation to South America. Uh, the, uh, the, the diagram of the volcano Chimborazo and elevation, elevation or vegetation zones were documented, although a, a French predecessor was 20 or 30 years ahead of this with... Uh, observations on mountains in southern France. Um, Humboldt also emphasised latitudinal belts of vegetation and first drew attention to the tropics as another potential area where plant life may, uh, in fact, have first arisen rather than the polar regions advocated by Buffon. Robert Brown uh, is uh, a really important person in terms of uh, Australian botany, but more, more generally in terms of uh, global botany. He was a botanist uh, uh, under the patronage of Joseph Banks on the Flinders expedition and he was the first British botanist to use the natural system that the French were advocating uh, when he published, self-published uh, the first volume of his uh, prodromus on the uh, flora uh, of Australia in 1810 which um, sold only a few copies and uh, unfortunately he decided not to proceed with the second volume. But that uh, work is a classic in systematic botany where he uh, named many new species, many, uh, many new families and genera and applied uh, an approach that uh, rings right through to the present day. His use of the microscope, for example, and focusing on anatomy uh, is legendary, legendary. And he also applied what they then called botanical mathematics, looking at the distribution of taxa and... Uh, uh, counting up the numbers of species and the numbers that are endemic to specific regions in terms of uh, trying to document phytogeographical pattern. Candole followed on uh, with this, uh, this approach and was the first to identify plant-based biogeographic regions, uh, 
both uh, areas of endemism, continental and island-like. <clears throat> but botany wasn't faring too well in the early 1800s, and this is a graph of uh, uh, the number of published reports by discipline from over a decade or so, reported at the uh, British Association for the Academy of Science. And botany is buried uh, in uh, uh, the light blue part of the pie chart there, which was mostly dominated by zoology. Botany at this stage was an important adjunct to medicine, and the surprising thing to me is, is, is medicine itself, which is right here uh, in the pink bar. Um, what an, an extraordinary contrast to uh, the preeminence of medicine um, today. Uh, so William Jackson Hooker uh, emerges over this period up to um, uh, 1859 as the first director of Kew when Kew became a national botanic garden after 20 years post Sir, Je Sir Joseph Banks' death, post uh, George III's death, and uh, Kew almost uh, succumbed uh, to become a, an urban park with its horticultural collections being given to the Royal Horticultural Society. But an independent review um, led to the recommendation adopted by government under some pressure from uh, preeminent scientists of the day to make it the National Botanic Garden. And fortunately, Sir William J Jackson Hooker was appointed as the first director. He brought with him a private herbarium of over a million specimens, a private library, uh, an enormous network of correspondence. And uh, within five years, uh, Kew had grown from around about 15 acres uh, to 250 acres under Sir William's leadership, and the Palm House was the first major construction, uh, which uh, was tremendously visionary in its day and still influences the design of Palm Houses right through to the present. And finally, uh, up to 1759, we, we cannot overlook uh, Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace, their famous uh, joint paper in uh, 1758, uh, delivered at the Linnaean Society on Evolution by Natural Selection and then the subsequent publication of Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species, um, whose uh, 150th anniversary was celebrated just uh, a week ago. The, the interesting uh, transition in the next 100 years was really uh, about uh, botany emerging as a science in its own right um, most of the philosophical botanists were financially independent and uh, arguably it was regarded as, as not entirely form to be paid to do uh, science, in the, certainly in the early 1800s. Charles Darwin is a classic example of the gentleman uh, biologist, uh, eminently credentialed uh, and very gentlemanly behaviour was involved in science from the outset. Um, that continues right through to the present day. It's really poor form to uh, have a heated discussion at a meeting like this. Um, and it's, uh, uh, there is an etiquette involved in uh, independent and objective analysis of ideas, which we all aspire to, and try and divorce personality and, uh, and uh, uh, preconceptions in our, in our debate. And arguably that comes from uh, the philosophical botanist tradition, the gentleman uh, botanist uh, who really... Um, had sufficient independent means that they could focus on science uh, for the pure joy of discovery and elevation of ideas. Charles Darwin may not be known to you as a botanist, but I, I think there is fairly convincing evidence, and this is a graph uh, uh, put uh, together by David Penny from New Zealand, <coughs> which shows uh, the number of pages uh, published by Darwin on different disciplines uh, you can see the geology in the red was very important in the first two decades of Darwin's scientific career, but then the green bars dominate thereafter. And indeed, uh, when he was thinking most about the origin of species, his primary scientific output was in botanical science. And that continued uh, on for three decades um, as being the dominant interest. It's interesting how small uh, the, the zoological contribution is and yet if you read most histories, you would see geology and zoology emphasised most. Uh, in fact, Charles Darwin wrote more books on botany than he did on any other subject. And uh, in fact, I think it's, it's not exaggerating to say that Darwin established uh, modern experimental botany as we now know it today. Um, he was certainly a major contributor, if not uh, the person who established uh, that approach. Um, the second uh, um, predecessor of Lord Rees, who I wanted to emphasise, who was both uh, director of Kew 
and president of the Royal Society is Sir Joseph Hooker. <coughs> um, Joseph, Sir Joseph Hooker um, was uh, formidable in his taxonomic output, and uh, there's a wonderful biography that has come out called um, Imperial Nature, uh, published just last, last year, which really develops this, this theme about uh, Sir Joseph was an example of a, of a man of relatively modest means who in his career transitioned from uh, a person who um, uh, was on the government payroll as a Navy officer initially uh, to becoming associated with Q and brought credibility to uh, the professional scientific career of botany. Um, it was, was no longer dishonourable or a poor form to be paid to pursue science and Hooker was fundamentally involved in this transition in the 1800s. As part of that, uh, the argument has been put that uh, Hooker had to ensure that Q uh, remained preeminent and became preeminent uh, as the botanical centre point uh, for certainly the empire, uh, if, not, if not broader. And uh, there's an element of, of uh, power and control that was uh, built into the way he operated. <clears throat> in terms of his fundamental science, he was interested in the laws of plant geography. Um, he was an advocate for hypothetical land masses in terms of explaining um, uh, uh, patterns of plant distribution. He wrote uh, uh, one of the earliest and most uh, important um, papers on island uh, biogeography and indeed influenced Darwin considerably in terms of analysing the Galapagos flora uh, for which Darwin made a comprehensive botanical collection. And uh, from where I come, uh, Hooker was the first person to review Australian phytogeography and uh, uh, point out what I call uh, Hooker's conundrum, that uh, this is a remarkably flat landscape, incredibly rich in plant species and in endemics. Uh, in fact, richer than an equivalent area of southeastern Australia, which is much more mountainous, much more habitat diverse. And Hooker pointed out this anomaly. At the time he pointed it out, it was believed that the landscape of southwestern Australia was extremely young um, and recently emerged from the sea, a view that Darwin held. Um, uh, and Hooker pointed out that maybe the geologists have got it wrong and this is an old landscape. Um, so really interesting reading from that point of view. I just wanted to compare and contrast uh, Hooker's concept of species with that of Darwin's. Uh, Hooker was w working from herbarium specimens primarily and he had a global view. So he was looking at transnational herbarium collections. He had a view that species were polymorphic, that is, uh, it was reasonable that a lot, a lot of variation could occur within species. Uh, and uh, he used as one of his yardsticks that intermediates between recognisable forms meant that the recognisable forms were not species, but they were varieties, um, a, a, view, a view that uh, many botanists hold right through to the present day. He argued that it's better to be conservative and to lump things uh, together as one species uh, that's variable rather than run the risk of calling things species that uh, might in the end uh, turn out to be varieties. And he had a particular... Uh, bent at trying to both encourage the colonial collectors upon whom he relied for uh, incoming um, information, um, but to discourage them from naming uh, species in their own right. Um, and he had a special um, a dislike of what he calls uh, splitters or species mongers, uh, those who traded in uh, naming superfluous minor variants as species in, from his point of view. He argued that that considerably impeded botanical science. And uh, this, this perspective really comes from Endersby's uh, book, um, which relates to the way Hooker's career and uh, the way that he was reliant on herbarium specimens as the primary form of evidence, uh, as well as geographical information. Consider Charles Darwin's species concept, and there's a wonderfully uh, eloquent paper published in 1868 that looked at an old question and that is to do with whether the, the primrose and the cowslip were different species or varieties. Linnaeus regarded them as varieties. Uh, Sir James Edward, Edward Smith, who uh, bought Linnaeus's collections and brought them back to form the Linnaean Society, said, no, they're different species. And uh, Darwin's uh, mentor uh, and botanical teacher, Professor Henslow, uh, sided with Linnaeus. <coughs> Darwin uh, applied what could arguably be uh, a more biological approach to species, and that is that in addition to looking at herbarium specimens, you can look at live plants. 
and things like the, the colour of the cowslip and primrose flowers disappear when you, when you squash and dry them as herbarium specimens. There are two characters that Darwin argued are important uh, if you uh, are able to look at live organisms. He also experimentally intercrossed um, uh, the primrose and the cowslip and demonstrated high sterility, uh, very low seed set. Um, he also demonstrated that if you get seed from wild populations of primrose or cowslip, then they are true breeding. You don't get uh, spontaneous emergence of a cowslip from a primrose um, uh, seed lot and, and vice versa. <clears throat> uh, he did observe that there are rare natural hybrids called oxlips and that they are sterile. They, they, have, they don't set seed uh, or they set very little seed um, and uh, their pollen is sterile. And he concluded in this paper that based on that combination of evidence that it is reasonable to, to regard the primrose and cowslip as good and true species. Uh, what Darwin really did, I think, was demonstrate uh, that uh, the difference between species and varieties is a quantitative one, that there are many forms of evidence that you can apply to the question, but ultimately it is a, it is a judgment. Um, if you believe in biological characters, uh, then this, le this approach leads to a finer species concept than what Hooker was advocating. And the two of them never, never reconciled that, that difference. Hooker was content with being uh, supportive of Darwin and the theory of evolution um, through natural selection by, uh, by proposing that uh, varieties uh, and uh, natural selection working on varieties is fine, but when you hit species, you're at a, at a point which uh, only um, transnational herbarium botanists can really determine. So you have to listen to them if you want to know what the species are and all this other stuff going on within species is evolution just, uh, just uh, working out um, uh, things that are going on. I think that's really interesting. It's also interesting to reflect on Hooker's um, presidential address uh, when he retired in 1878 from the Royal Society and look at the ideas he, he looked at. First life and vegetation zones, he basically, 100 years after Buffon supported uh, two papers, uh, one by Supporter the, and the other by Thistleton Dyer, ultimately his son-in-law, that um, if not originating at the North Pole, um, most, ve most life and most vegetation zones uh, uh, originated somewhere near the North Pole. And uh, it, it really was a reiteration of some of the arguments that Buffon had uh, demonstrated. The age of the Earth hadn't been resolved uh, by geophysicists and... Uh, and it's really interesting just to just reflect not that, f that far uh, in the past. People were coming up um, in very august situations with these hypotheses and, and giving them a degree of credence. Uh, he celebrated mi microscopy and alluded to uh, earlier uh, secretaries of the Royal Society like Robert Hooke and Nathaniel Grew uh, and pointed to Ferdinand Bauer, the artist's um, first ob observation of nuclei in cells and Robert Brown's confirmation of that. In physiological botany, he said, we find no one has advanced this subject so greatly as Mr Darwin in the last uh, five years or preceding the address. Uh, lichens had only been um, determined as, as a symbiotic association of algae uh, and fungi um, uh, by the German botanist Simon uh, Sherwin Denner. And from the systematic point, uh, viewpoint, George Bentham's Flora Australiensis was the highlight that Hooker emphasised and work on Flora Brasiliensis. Apart from those two gentlemen, other emerging concepts um, that, that really have been fundamentally important were uh, Gregor Mendel's work on par particulate inheritance, his famous crossing of peas, and out of that came a number of concepts that uh, prevail, have prevailed um, really pioneering mathematically uh, precise and experimental work that have given us uh, a range of these concepts that uh, are listed on the slide um, that inform ongoing work in genetics right through to, to the present. <clears throat> I'll jump uh, forward into the, the post-World War II uh, Green Revolution just to emphasise uh, the intensification of agriculture um, and uh, uh, the importance that has played in defying Malthus uh, and in demonstrating that uh, uh, gains in agricultural productivity uh, could be achieved by ap applying um, advances in contemporary botanical science to crop plants. 
the Green Revolution occurred um, with the use of massive investments, however, of nutrients, of herbicides and of insecticides, and the environmental consequences of the Green Revolution uh, have now, now become evident and the need for uh, a rethink of some of, the, some of the approaches is patently obvious. And uh, very clearly the discovery of DNA um, uh, occurred in this period leading up to 1959. And I'm really impressed that uh, the, uh, the foundational paper there is before you. It was a single page in Nature. Um, that's uh, absolute brevity for a revolutionary idea. And uh, I'm afraid I'm guilty of not being able to uh, adhere to such a, such a remarkable discipline in, in my own work as many of us uh, struggle to. The coming century, uh, the proposition I would like to put, put to you is perhaps we are looking at a new green revolution. And I just want to take you through a few areas that pertain to Q's work. Uh, the, the ongoing attempt to understand the diversity of plant life on the planet hasn't stopped. Uh, 2,000 new species are described each year globally and a further 2,000 <coughs> are reclassified, uh, often based on DNA sequencing. And remarkable organisms still turn up. I, I illustrate here for 1994 the Wallamai pine, discovered 150 kilometres from the heart of Sydney, um, known from fossils, uh, or near relatives of fossils that uh, were late Cretaceous, 80 uh, million year, years old, um, before it was discovered as a live plant. Uh, the DNA revolution has, has really enabled uh, a rigorous injection of science into uh, the uh, systematic botany in general and uh, we are in a place now where not all the argument that uh, Hooker and Darwin, for example, on species uh, uh, illustrate uh, uh, need prevail. We, we can resolve with much greater provision and rep replication the relationships of many organisms. We'll still argue a little bit about the rank at which uh, species, genera, etc., are going to be recognised, but the relationships are becoming much more convincingly demonstrated. And uh, next year, we hope we will replicate, uh, following Linnaeus's attempt uh, um, 250 years ago, uh, a global checklist of plants by combining the, uh, the databases that uh, Kew and Missouri Botanic Garden and other um, uh, major botanic gardens and institutions have acquired over this grand synthesis of taxonomic botany for 250 years. There have been some places, quite surprisingly, where exceptional recent discovery has occurred. And southwestern Australia, I would give as an example, here's a trace of the number of recognised um, taxa <coughs> going back to Linnaeus in 1760 through to the turn of our most recent century. And uh, the interesting thing is that when I was a student, uh, the number of recognised species in southwestern Australia was one third less than what we now know. In the last 30 years, an incredible pace of discovery has occurred. There are still places on the planet uh, that require the attention of survey botanists and good collectors. We are now in the era of, uh, of omics, informatics, applying e-taxonomy and, uh, and the internet to global communications. And this is leading to an unprecedented um, celebration of the diversity of information uh, to do with plants and uh, communication of science is now possible um, in a way that was never dreamed of. And I think uh, great strides have been made in recent years and great strides indeed are just around the corner. Molecular phylogenetics, I've uh, already signalled, has been a revolutionary development in botany and uh, <clears throat> this has uh, been spearheaded by an unprecedented degree of collaboration uh, among lab laboratories around the world uh, where Q has played an important lead role um, and uh, the flowering plants are now the largest group of organisms that have been reclassified based on uh, a molecular phylogenetic understanding of relationships um, and uh, uh, incredible advances are, are ongoing. <coughs> In terms of geology and uh, phytogeography, um, uh, plate tectonics and continental drift have finally resolved some fundamental questions that uh, people have agonised over um, for, for many uh, decades and indeed centuries. Consider the Proteaceae, for example, the family that includes Banksias and Proteas, mainly southern hemisphere. Um, uh, the small inset map just shows you the distribution of the family. And it, it it's a, was, was regarded as a classic Gondwanan family, that is a family that... Um, is most common on the elements, uh, continental, 
continental elements that form, formed uh, part of Gondwana. So a reasonable hypothesis might be that this family arose when Gondwana, the supercontinent, existed and basically the, the parts have separated and there's been evolutionary divergence as, it, as, as the continental fragments have separated. Um, Darwin and Hooker uh, argued about this endlessly. I mentioned Hooker believed in uh, sunken land masses, a precursor, if you like, to the idea uh, that plate tectonics uh, now offers. <clears throat> but Darwin was a strong advocate of the notion that dispersal across oceans was possible, and he did some very elegant experiments demonstrating the tolerance to salinity of, of plant seeds uh, in competition with Hooker. Uh, they both were testing various seeds to, to challenge uh, this idea. In, uh, in the case of the Proteaceae, uh, based on DNA sequencing, uh, we can calibrate uh, evolutionary trees of organisms now against uh, fossils of known age, and we now have a handle on um, the evolution of pro the Proteaceae and can superimpose a timeline, which is shown at, at the bottom here. So um, we're looking here at Gondwana 130 million years ago. Um, Gondwana started to fragment by 100 million years ago, 96 shown here. And these lines just uh, show you what the Proteaceae was doing over that period of time. Very clearly, the family uh, didn't exist 130 million years ago, other than the pre precursor of all the genera and uh, subcomponents we now recognise. So the notion that the family is so old that it was on Gondwana and it just the, the subfamilies and genera diverged um, subsequently uh, doesn't hold. There must have been some transoceanic dispersal and uh, Darwin's hypothesis has been reaffirmed by this approach. Um, we are increasingly learning that uh, transoceanic dispersal as well as vicariance on continental fragments uh, is the story and that, that's been replicated in many plant and animal groups uh, as DNA sequencing and calibrated uh, chronologies have, have come into, into uh, constant use. I just wanted to draw attention very briefly to a body of theory I've been involved in, which is looking at the world's oldest climatically buffered, least fertile landscapes and asking the question, do patterns of ecology, evolution uh, and conservation conform to uh, most of the literature, which is focused on relatively young, uh, more dynamically um, changing climatic landscapes, where glaciers, for example, have been evident, uh, and uh, more fertile landscapes. And this approach is opening up a number of questions that are being experimentally tested um, as, as I speak. So photogeography and the understanding of plant distribution has advanced leaps and bounds uh, through its um, cross-stimulation with the geological uh, and climatological sciences. I, I want to wind up by just looking at a few uh, trends that relate to the contemporary and future challenges. And uh, this is just to remind us... Uh, with the historical um, uh, span of this talk, uh, where the human population was. So less than a billion in 1759, little over a billion, 1859, up to uh, approaching uh, three and a half billion by 1959 and, and uh, almost trebling its forecast by 2059. Fundamentally uh, different pressures on the planet because of that. And uh, this has led to the re relatively recent emergence of a series of disciplines in botany that are focused about uh, addressing the impact of humans and trying to devise ways of us living uh, sustainably um, with biodiversity and indeed ensuring that we live sustainably and have a, have a future that uh, is one we would all aspire to. Conservation biology, restoration ecology, reconciliation ecology are the, are the disciplines that are emerging at the moment. And <clears throat> just to show you a little bit of what history can teach uh, about this this, uh, this approach, this is a, a body of da data published in Jared Diamond's book on collapse. Uh, it was called Societal Collapse and he looked at 81 Pacific Islands with a, a colleague and asked the question, what are the, the correlates of long-term sustainable forestry uh, by these people? The important correlate was a wet tropical climate uh, above all, plenty of water uh, and uh, plenty of heat. <clears throat> But also having fertile landscapes was really important to uh, uh, encourage growth of forests and ensure sustainability. So <clears throat> regular soil enrichment by volcanic ash, uh, uh, mountain building or glacial action. Having a large area and being close to neighbours also helps. And uh, 
perhaps uh, reasonably important was to have inaccessible landscapes to people. Uh, Makatea, uplifted coral is pretty hard to walk on in bare feet and uh, consequently forests protected by that sort of landscape um, really had a chance of persistence. <coughs> uh, if you look at the, the converse, what is associated with societies that have collapsed, it's very clear that it's not simple environmental determinism. It's a mixture of, of both. It's, it's human interactions with environment. Uh, climate change is a, is a strong correlate with those societies that have collapsed. Having hostile neighbours doesn't help. You can be doing everything right yourself and then be overrun by neighbours with a different landscape ethic. Um, and equally, you can rely on friendly trading partners who uh, collapse in their own society and, and that has a direct impact on you. Uh, to be unchanging in your cultural values uh, uh, doesn't help at all for long-term persistence. And Diamond observes that collapse uh, has often occurred at the peak of prosperity. Just when people really think life is, is good, um, then uh, it comes, uh, uh, comes with a thud. <clears throat> and uh, the challenge is fundamentally to convince leaders in particular um, that there are real problems out there um, uh, when the leaders are relatively isolated from everyday life. So what might this uh, very quick... Uh, canter through botanical history teach us uh, in looking forward that I think both the collecting exercise and uh, science in the experimental point of view are reliant upon each other. I would make that proposition to you. Um, the wonder and joy of discovery hasn't desisted. In fact, it's increasing daily. There are just tremendous things still to be discovered uh, waiting out there for us. There is money to be made from plants. Uh, there, there always has, has been and there always will be. Uh, but we do have limitations on the use of plants and that's one of the big challenges we are, we are uh, running up to now with climate change and uh, agriculture, uh, for example. There is a risk uh, in botany, as there is in all science, of uh, uh, a sole focus on reductionism and mathematical approaches. Um, we have to, have to mix uh, 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 reductionism and mathematical approaches uh, with the more synthetic approaches to the discipline if we're really going to see the big picture and understand um, major trends um, beyond uh, um, uh, the minute detail of specialisation that is a tendency today. And uh, I think if you reflect on uh, Darwin and Hooker in terms of species concepts, that hypothesis testing and having a sense of humility uh, do ultimately prevail over control and command models of, of the conduct of science. So I think learning, if we can learn, as Darwin did, that it is wise to exalt plants, uh, we, will, we will do very well indeed. What are we going to do in the future? Uh, how, how is botany uh, going to respond to Lord Stern's call to action for people in all walks of life, that business as usual isn't an option if we're going to deal with um, the environmental challenges that, that face us uh, uh, right now and in which we are embedded? Um, there is no question, I think, that uh, we are uh, in the midst of um, a, a major turning point from a historical perspective. These are graphs just showing you the average uh, annual deforest deforestation rates with the yellow histograms for a range of countries. The maps of Borneo are going from uh, the 1950s through to, the, through to 2020, uh, the green area being the area of wild vegetation, and the red graphs are peatland um, uh, uh, emissions resulting from uh, degradation of peatlands. Uh, we are tangibly affecting the planet and if we are to deal with this problem, uh, the services of plant and fungal diversity science, I would suggest, are going to be critical to uh, sustainable s solutions for the future. One of the challenges we have is that even though the rate of uh, loss of wild uh, vegetation and degradation has accelerated with human population growth, uh, you could look at this taxonomic productive, uh, production graph and say, well, it's remained static over the last two decades. It hasn't accelerated uh, to try and keep up with the rate of destruction. So it, it, it's reasonable to conclude uh, that we are um, uh, undoubtedly um, missing out on extraordinary plants that are, are undiscovered and unused. Uh, there is some leadership occurring, and I would just... Um, uh, modestly suggests that in relation to fungi, we've had a recent challenge where um, uh, CABI, uh, the Commonwealth Agricultural Bureau International, 
uh, could no longer support its mycological collection of 400,000 species and came to Kew and said, could you manage this? And uh, the House of Lords, uh, through their most recent of the three reviews on systematics, um, emphasised that this was an important and critical point for mycology, uh, a discipline that really is going to make a difference into the future. And uh, DEFRA uh, assisted uh, the trustees of Kew uh, through some financial support to enable um, the CABI collection to be amalgamated. It's now happening as I speak, uh, just starting this week, and it will be the world's largest mycological collection, uh, even though the number of scientists to run it are, are very small, few indeed. And what does this, what does this mean? Why, why would you care? Well, if you've used penicillin, they've come from that uh, wonder drug has come from fungi. Fungi are used for food in various forms. Fungi are going to be absolutely crit critical for restoration of the world's carbon sinks, uh, mycorrhizal fungi that, that um, uh, work underground and assist plants to grow um, in difficult circumstances. And many plant diseases are caused by fungi. We have to understand them. Uh, Irish uh, potato famine, for example, was caused by a species of fungus. Um, and uh, there, is a, uh, there are a number of diseases currently rampant uh, affecting oaks, affecting many species in southwestern Australia through a Phytophthora species in the same genus. Uh, what can we do? Uh, well, the Millennium Seed Bank uh, is, is a project uh, that is a partnership involving 53 countries, and that is, a, I think, a remarkable example of collaboration at international level that has achieved an outcome unprecedented in conservation biology, uh, achieving uh, storage of 10% of the, uh, the world's known flora at 2,000 in seed banks in the country of origin and backed up by the one at Wakehurst Place. This program is now moving into the next phase of getting another 15%, but also enabling the use of plant diversity for human benefit. I would propose that at this point in history, we really need to focus, uh, collaborate and mobilise in botanical science. There is an urgency. The, the messages are coming through loud and clear that the next five years are in fact uh, probably, the science is based on modelling, but probably a tipping point in terms of our ability to control uh, deforestation and emissions. And it's going to be that much harder if we defer for another five years on this. Um, Plant-based solutions to some of the challenges, for example, restoring carbon sinks, uh, are very evidence, evident. I would argue that people are dying today because of the lack of our uh, ability to convey plant knowledge um, uh, to people, particularly in relation to minor crops um, and uh, traditional medicines. And uh, that's an intolerable situation where we all have to double our efforts to try and uh, overcome that, that big challenge. There's a need for humility. Um, there is very clearly no single botanical fix for the world's problems. Uh, it is about local plants for local people. Uh, we need people who are trained in botany across the globe, focusing on their flora and caring for it. Uh, we all aspire to sustainable, healthy lives and plant diversity can contribute uh, arguably uh, towards that aim. And we have this fundamental uh, importance, I think, of what I call the greatest legacy of conveying a sense of hope to the world that even though we face formidable challenges, there are ways we can deal with it. Q has come up with, uh, over the last three years, a program called the Breathing Planet Strategy. And I'll just put up this slide um, to illustrate the seven strategies. Uh, the three in blue are about uh, accelerating the science and, uh, and the information uh, access, uh, looking at where we should focus our conservation priorities and achieving outcomes on the ground to care for the remaining wild vegetation, plant diversity and carbon sinks. We can then focus on locally appropriate plant species to improve the human quality of life and plant-based adaptation to global change. And we can use seed banks for insurance and sustainable use. The new science of restoration ecology is also going to be fundamentally important to recover lost plant diversity, productivity and carbon sequestration. And we have to use botanic gardens intelligently uh, as shop fronts to really uh, communicate to the world uh, the joy and wonder of plants and their critical importance to the future. So I'll conclude on just five verbs um, uh, for botanical science for the next uh, 50 years. Focus is absolutely critical. I think we, we have reached a point where all botanical uh, scientists, all people, young people aspiring to be botanists, should ask the question, 
Are they working in an area that will make a difference uh, to all of us pulling through uh, the environmental challenges we face um, and, uh, and caring for plant diversity and using it in a, in a way that will really make uh, a significant improvement in the quality of life? We need, need to collaborate like never before, not only within botanical science but across all disciplines and all sectors of the community. And we need to mobilise whatever resources we have. Um, we need to use them in the best possible way. Uh, we need to inspire. Um, botany is a, a relatively uh, modest and um, uh, young discipline um, compared to some of the larger mainstream sciences um, that are practised on the planet at the moment. And the best way that we can achieve outcomes where uh, botanical science can make a, an ongoing and genuine contribution is to inspire others through providing leadership projects and examples of how this science uh, uh, has made a difference and will make a difference. And above all, we have to deliver. We can't just uh, sit around and talk about this. We've really got to uh, deliver for the world and for, for each of us, for um, people who, are, who will follow us if we're to see our way through um, the, the significant challenges that I've alluded to. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. A few questions. Steve, has left time for a few questions. Uh, can I ask anyone who wants to ask a question to wait till one of the two microphones reaches you and then stand up if possible? So who's going to speak, speak first? Yes. No. no questions? Yes. Is one question right at the back there? And can we have a second one for the second microphone? One there. I'm sorry to appear so ignorant, and I've learnt a lot tonight, but can you explain exactly what philosophical botany is? My understanding <coughs> is that it was uh, the precursor for the name scientific botany or professional botany. Um, so for... The philosophical botanist was the botanist interested in, um, in measurement and experiment as applied to plants, uh, applying the scientific method, if you like, to understand how plants function, uh, to understand process as well as pattern. Um, so if you like, it's, it's embedded in the title of the talk, um, uh, the experimental sciences as, as against the descriptive sciences looking at, at pattern. The other... Um, connotation with philosophical botany was that it was usually practised by males who were wealthy. Um, so, so as I emphasised before, if you had sufficient means, you, you pursued uh, knowledge for the sheer joy of, of discovery in the Enlightenment. And uh, the philosophical botanists were those like Erasmus da Darwin, who really um, wanted to advance understanding of plants as living organisms uh, that, that uh, had processes and uh, went through change. Um, as, as, as a complement to the, the pattern of describing and um, documenting the distribution of plants. There's a question there. Um, shouldn't there be spore banks and perhaps mycelium banks as well as seed banks? A very good question, and I couldn't agree more. There are, there are some spore banks... Uh, People who are, who are interested in orchids, for example, um, orchids have a very precise relationship uh, with uh, uh, underground fungi, my, mycorrhizae. Uh, and uh, the garden that I managed before I came to Kew, Kings Park and Botanic Garden, has a, has a living collection of, of uh, fungi stored in liquid nitrogen. Uh, I think spore banks uh, do exist for, for those people who work on ferns. Um, and uh, the, the word seed, you could put a lowercase s, if you like, and embrace uh, other, other propagules. I also wonder about uh, those uh, zoological organisms that have persistent diaspores. Uh, surely they would be um, eligible for a similar approach as an insurance strategy, at least, um, where we could store their propagules in the same way that seed and spores are stored at the moment for plants. Thank you. Doesn't the papermaking industry have banks of um, microorganisms that cause trouble in papermaking? Um, pyra, uh, 
I'm, I'm not exactly sure of where. Uh, very good question. I'm afraid I, I'm not uh, knowledgeable at all about the, the paper making industry, but we all know that uh, paper, if it gets wet, <laughs> is, is affected by, by fungi and, and the like. Is that what you're alluding to? fibre that's called stuff um, it was imported wet sometimes I see. and if it has microorganisms working in it you get elliptical <laughs> holes in the paper forming when it's going through the machine this is machine made paper Yes, a good example of uh, the importance of uh, diversity science ap applied to uh, uh, economic use of, of plant material Questions? Uh, one there, and then one there. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you. Um, um, generalising on the the influence of uh, industry and commerce in um, botanical matters, botanical. I mean, clearly the activities of you know drug companies, companies promoting GM crops, and so on and so forth, interact with what um, uh, botanical um, scientists are involved in as well. I mean, a lot of financial support comes from that area as well. I mean, net, net, do you, do you think this is a, a force for, for good? Do you see them as allies in solving the world's ecological problems? Uh, I think uh, uh, the approaches you, you've alluded to um, should be part of our toolkit into the future, absolutely. Uh, what you have to do is understand the risks and uh, apply those tools intelligently. Uh, collaboration with business, I, I think, is, is absolutely essential. I mean, we're all in this together, and if you're running a business, uh, I'm sure you would have an interest in wanting to be sustainable and viable into the future just as, as much as anyone from any other walk of life. So I, I, I would encourage uh, collaboration across industry, government, non-government, uh, university, you know, right across the board. We've got to forge relationships to get best possible use out of plants. If we're going to feed the world, then uh, some of the technologies uh, uh, like GM, many countries have already adopted, and, uh, you know, that's, that is part of the toolkit. There are some situations where GM uh, has genuine risk and there would be merit in thinking very carefully about use of it. There are many, many other situations where it's, uh, it's a reasonable technology to apply uh, to increase food production and, and add some of the uh, uh, resistance to some of the challenges that, that, are, that are facing the world. So I'm relaxed about that. I, I just think like any science, it's not value-free, it's not removed from the broader society, and we have to agree as a broader society on what is a reasonable way forward in, in view of the risks. Um, Bill Stewart. Uh, Thanks very much. First, first of all, Steve, I, I thought that was a very interesting and good lecture. I think it, it promotes the fact that the UK is very fortunate in having Q. And I say that because I'm biased, become, because I'm a trustee at Q. But I think nationally we must never forget that. And its international dimension is hugely important. It's, I think it's a global asset. Having said that, let me now uh, turn to another question that... Um, I've been thinking about as this uh, talk went on. Primary production on land is about, um, what is it, 56% of global primary production. 46% of global primary production occurs in the sea. And at the present time, we're paying an enormous amount of attention to what happens on land, on deforestation, etc. CO2, I mean, and yet primary production increases, uh, in the oceans at least, with increase in CO2. And I wonder to what extent that has been taken into account by those who consider primary production, um, climate change, and all these other things. Like you said, um, life um, perhaps evolved in, in the north, in the polar regions. Well, vegetation might have, but for sure the microorganisms which first occurred on the surface on the air, of the earth were aquatic organisms which were living probably across the surface of the earth. So I think we, we must remember the 100% of primary production 
that occurs in this um, um, globe of ours. Thanks, thanks very much, Bill. Uh, let me uh, just dismiss one hypothesis. I don't support the notion that life evolved at the poles. <laughs> your, your point is, is, your main point is, is uh, in fact, very apt, and there, there is a lot of focus, I think, on uh, caring for the oceans. Um, uh, big concerns about the acidification of oceans and that impact on, on the primary producers uh, that you allude to. Uh, Q, Q is interesting in that algae, that there was a, a famous agreement between the Natural History Museum and Q uh, called the Morton Agreement, um, which divided up the, plant, uh, the plants into different groups. And part of that agreement was that algae uh, would go to the Natural History Museum. So I, I apologise for not emphasising um, the algae. You're, you're dead right. And I think as, as Q is, is trying to make its uh, contribution to some of the solutions... We really do need to collaborate uh, uh, with the Natural History Museum, with people interested in marine organisms as well. We, we obviously focus on seagrasses, uh, which, which are important in some circumstances. I, I just wanted to also uh, echo, as a relatively recent director of Kew, your, your comment that Kew is uh, a fundamental jewel in the UK crown. It was one of the reasons why I came here. It's, it's part of international scientific infrastructure. Uh, and the sort of collections that Q and its similar uh, gardens maintain, the large gardens, are, to me, equivalent to the radio telescopes of, uh, for astronomy. Um, they're just critical for the UK uh, to advance its science and globally for, for global science to be advanced. Um, so I uh, am, and feel greatly uh, privileged to be part of this organisation and to play a role. Um, I share your passion uh, for plants, Bill, and... Uh, and the need to have that global overview is just fundamental. I think that's a good note on which we should close. We've overrun our time, but I would like to say we've had a wonderful panoramic lecture uh, celebrating the past and the great pioneers and looking forward to the future and reminding us that uh, the uh, biological habitat is crucial to all of us and our future. And I can't think of a better lecture which can celebrate the uh, culmination of... Q's anniversary year, nor a better way in which we in the Royal Society, by hosting you tonight, can have started off our own anniversary year. So it's been a wonderful lecture, and we're all grateful to you, Stephen. So thank you very much indeed for being here. <laughs>